The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet of Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw their two other brothers, two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please pray with me. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Today's sermon is going to be a little bit different than usual. Because um, I wanted to share some thoughts and um, just look at the scripture in a slightly different way. I'm often struck by the way that things seem to connect in a person's life. Um, especially when, when I open my eyes and I pay attention to all that's around me and then I'm observing, observing constantly. Um, part of the work that Pastor Steve and I do as preachers and other preachers do um, every week and, and really all the time is to open our eyes and pay attention and draw connections between people and other people or theology or people in the Bible or a person's faith or how God is at work within and among us. I don't know honestly why I continue to be surprised when I have connections like that, but um, because by this time in my life, I feel like it happens all the time. Um, but I, I am surprised, even though I should expect it at any rate, though, I do get a little bit giddy because I'm a theological nerd, too. <laughs> so this week, I had some of those connections happen, and I wanted to share some of those with you um, and hopefully help you think about the Bible in a different way and how God can work in our lives and teach us if we just pay attention. So the first connection, um, you know, we, we have these stories that we do every three years. And so every three years we're preaching the same thing and we're reading the same thing. And I don't know, this was the first time that I really realized that the, the first reading was talking about um, how the light has shined on the, in the darkness in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali near, this, near Galilee, and that then that's where Jesus settles when he begins his ministry. I think it's so fascinating how so many times you can read something and not notice it, and then all of a sudden one day it just pops out, and it draws everything all together. So here's this, this part in the Old Testament in Isaiah it's even something that we read in Advent. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. But we didn't, I don't know, I didn't even remember the Naphtali and Zebulun part until we read it again today. And how it connects to then our story of Jesus, not only at his birth and coming into the world, but in the beginning of his new ministry. There's so many ways that we can connect that way. And Matthew's gospel especially would have connected to the Jewish folks. He was writing to the Jewish folks. And so, so many times in his gospel, he refers back to the Old Testament, to the old scriptures and stories for people to understand what's going on in the present. So the second connection uh, for me that started this week um, started with the, the Bible study that we're, we're doing on Wednesday evenings. We, uh, there's a group that's begun a, su a study on the series, The Chosen, um, and that group meets on Wednesday evenings. So if you're not part of a Bible study and you'd like to join up, you can still join up. It's not too late. Um, they meet at, uh, at 6 o'clock on Wednesdays, and I hope you'll consider attending it, but I have to admit, however, um, when we first started looking at this study, I was a little bit tentative because 
the writer and I don't really always agree theologically, and I was a little bit nervous. Um, I'm not particularly fond of some of his writings, but I do think it's a good idea for all of us to check out things and listen to things that are different from what we believe, too, so that we can learn and grow in a different way. And sometimes understanding the Bible from a different perspective can help us understand our own perspective better. So Pastor Steve and I decided to start watching this series, and I have to admit that it is not what I expected, and I have really enjoyed it. In fact, I binged all the way. Like, there was like three days where we watched all the way till the last episode of season one. Now I got to go back and, and get going again. And I would classify The Chosen as historical fiction simply because the details and the storylines of the people, they're made up. We don't really know. There's no way we could substantiate what happened. It's just an educated guess. And, and it is educated because they've done a lot of study as to what that day and that time would have looked like. But the things that Jesus says are very much a part of Scripture. And they do fit our understanding of what Jesus taught and how he taught it. And the thing that I like the most about this series is that it writes a story around the stories that we know from Scripture. We often get just these little snippets, right? So we read the story today about Jesus moving to the land of Galilee, and then we hear about him calling these first disciples. He happens to be walking along the shore. But, but why was he walking along the shore? And what did he have for breakfast that morning? And tries to help us see that biblical story played out instead of just getting those little bits and pieces. So when I read what today's gospel story was, I got really excited because I made the connection that one of my favorite episodes of The Chosen was about our gospel today. And it focused on that story, how Jesus called Simon and Andrew and James and John. And then what was even more exciting for me is that when I started reading the commentary this week that I always read um, about uh, the, the scriptures, it also connected to the series and the story. So then that connected to the study. And I just love it when things pop out and you start seeing them and hearing them in all sorts of different places when you're paying attention for that. So first, let me share a little bit about this scene, the people in the, um, in the series. Simon and Andrew are main characters, these two apostles. And um, Andrew's kind of like this responsible one, and he's kind of always taking care of things and, and um, a little bit of a worry wart. And then Simon is the impulsive one, which we would expect because he always says these things to Jesus, and then I'm sure he wishes he could just take them right back. He's always being admonished. And so their characters are really similar, and they, and they act like brothers. And then there's James and John and Zebedee, their father, and, and they all know each other. It's like they've connected them as friends, as people who would have, um, who would have had goings on together. And so then it also shows how Jesus has been living. All of a sudden, he's living in this uh, tent uh, near the sea. And it kind of connects with this beginning of today's passage about where he was living. Then, when I, when I read this commentary, it connected even a little bit better because um, the, the person who wrote the commentary this week, her name is Jillian Engel, Engelhart, and she's a, she has a PhD in biblical studies and New Testament studies, and her focus was Matthew. She teaches at Texas Christian and she talks about the story um, about James and John and Zebedee and Simon and Andrew probably belonging to this um, to a to a cohort, and they were probably contracted by the Romans because this was a, a time when they had to um, get permission to fish. So they would have had a contract with the Romans so that they could fish legally, and then they would have given some of their fish back to Rome. And so they probably did know each other, and they probably did fish together, and this is part of what is shown in the story on The Chosen. It's, it's betrayed so well, I felt like I could just imagine this story with all this information. Instead of just thinking in my head, what might that have been like, I was able to see this picture of the characters, and why were they fishing together, and why was it Jesus asking them, and what were they doing? And additionally... While Matthew's gospel doesn't talk about uh, Jesus teaching people on the shore and then getting into a boat to preach so people could see him and then 
um, the, the catch, the miraculous catch of fish, and then calling um, uh, Andrew and Simon, it, it is told that way in the Gospel of Luke. And so it's this whole story combined so that we get a better picture. And then in John's Gospel, there's mention that Simon and Andrew are among the first to be Jesus' disciples. And John talks about how Andrew heard Jesus and brought Simon along. And that's shown in the, in the show as well. So it, it brings all these stories together and it helps us imagine a bigger picture. What would it really have felt like? How could this really have happened? Because it wasn't like there was a trumpet, do, 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 Jesus is going to do this now. Because that's what it feels sometimes when we read gospel, right? It, was, it would have just happened naturally. When we see the bigger picture and we see this story in action, it helps us connect more deeply to the people in the story and to ourselves and into the meaning of what was going on and what God was doing. Now, of course, as I said, the backstories of these characters and how they relate to each other and the particulars in the show are completely made up. And so my advice is if you're not going to attend a, a Bible, the Bible study here, at least find um, the Bible study guide to help you go through it because it, it'll help you understand what is um, truthful and what is um, made up in this show. This show is historical fiction, but in some ways, I don't know that these details really matter either because it gives, still gives us a good picture of what happened that led up to those scriptural moments. And I think it also helps us be imaginative in asking some important questions about scripture instead of just focusing on the one story and then moving on to the next story without thinking about how they were all connected together because it was somebody's living out of their life. It helps us ask how, it helps us ask why. And when we ask how and why, we can begin to put our own lives into the story. We can begin to relate better. What would I have done? A few years back, we had that campaign, what would Jesus do? And there were bracelets and all sorts of things. That's the kind of question that we're asking here, that connections beg us to ask. My questions about this particular passage this week were, did the disciples know who Jesus was? Or had they at least seen him before they dropped everything and followed him? And why did they drop everything and follow him? And why him? Why did they know for some reason they should follow this guy? Did Jesus really live along the river in the woods like the show portrays? Or when Jesus made his home in Capernaum by the sea like we read in scripture, did he live in a house? Where did he shop? Who were his friends? Did he work and live alone? What did he do? And the story also makes me ask, why did he wait to start his ministry until after John the Baptist dies or is arrested? Was this a sign? Was this something that he knew was going to happen? Or did he just realize that things had now become crazy enough that it was time for him to step up and take his turn and to do his work? And that makes me wonder, when do we need to act? When is it our turn to step up and let God use our hands? What does this mean for us? And the disciples followed Jesus. They trusted. So maybe I can trust Jesus too. What does it mean to follow? Does it mean I walk away from certain things that I do? Or does it mean that I walk away from my old sinful self? Even what does Jesus mean by follow me? And what did Jesus mean? I will make you fish for people. Because usually when we hear that, we think about Jesus making disciples and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, which is what he tells us to do again at the end of Matthew. But what if this was really more in line with what Jill Jillian Englehart talks about and how this also helps us understand Jesus' upsetting the status quo and helping people really understand their allegiance to heaven and to God rather than Rome. So maybe when he says, I will make you fish for people, he's, he's saying, I won't make you fish for Rome. We will fish for the people who need food. We will fish for the people in poverty. That never occurred to me until this week. What questions do other stories raise for us as well? For instance, the Sermon on the Mount. Was that all that Jesus said, or was there more? And we just got the highlights. 
Matthew didn't write the gospel till later, so did he have a notebook and go back and use his notebook and his notes, or did he just tell the story so many times that he remembered it and finally decided to write it down? And why were these points the most important? It's all connected. So back to those connections, when we study the Bible, we learn, and when we live our lives, we learn, and when we open our eyes, we see how those things connect. When we discuss or study the context of the biblical times and ask questions of the stories of scripture, we learn even more, and we make connections with how those biblical examples relate to our own lives and experiences. And when we keep our eyes open and we listen and we talk to each other, we might just see it all coming together. For me, these are the reasons why we study the Bible and why we read the stories over and over, just like we read our children's favorite stories over and over to them when they're a kid. There's a couple books that I don't think I ever need to read again, right? We read it so many times, but they know those stories. And the same is true with the Bible. There are reasons why we do the same lessons every three years. There are reasons why, yes, adults, even us, we should read the story of Noah's Ark again, because you probably don't know everything you think you do. I actually failed a Noah's Ark test a few years back. I was very embarrassed. I took it with my students, and we all failed. <laughs> There's a lot of details that matter once we're a little bit older and they fit into the story in a different way. And while I believe it's important not to get too entangled in these little details, it is important to know them. It's important to talk about them, to question to relate them to the bigger picture in scripture. These connections help us to imagine and to grow and make even more connections that help us see gospel as a story, not just about Simon and Peter and James and John, but it's a story about us and how God works in our lives also. God's story is our story. And we are called just as Simon and Andrew and James and John were called, we are here and we have heard God's call. And now we can go out into the world connecting it all together for others.